In the last video, I built this pretty cool automatic continuously variable transmission. If I apply some resistance to the output axle, you can see that the two wheels automatically change size to reduce the gear ratio and give the output more torque at a lower speed. But how do we know that the output torque has actually increased? We can see that the output speed is lower, but this could just mean that power is being wasted somewhere in the mechanism. And if the output torque is in fact increasing, how do we know that the motor isn't just having to work harder to provide it? To show that this is in fact working correctly, my plan here was to design some kind of torque measuring device, so that then I can connect one to the input and one to the output of this CVT. And if it is working as intended, we will see that when I apply more resistance to the output, the output torque increases, but the input torque stays relatively constant, thanks to the automatically changing gear ratio. And then, once I know that this is working correctly, I can put it in a car and give it a drive. So, let's get started. My first, and worst, idea for a torque measurer was to put a differential along the length of the shaft, like this. If there's no resistive torque along the shaft, it spins freely, but if I apply some resistance to the other end, the differential housing also tries to rotate, which stretches the rubber band further the harder I try to stop the output, which indicates that there's more torque being transferred through the mechanism. So, what makes this design so bad? Well, while this does measure the torque that the motor is producing, it measures it by using up most of this torque to stretch the rubber band and keep it stretched, so there's way less torque left to actually power anything with. You can see this if I connect a pair of these clutch gears to the input and output, which slip if I apply enough torque. When I try and turn the one connected to the input, it slips while the output one doesn't, showing that we're putting in way more torque than we're getting out. In fact, it takes two of these clutch gears on the input for the input and output axles to slip roughly equal amounts, indicating that we're losing half of the input torque just to this mechanism. So, knowing that I'm losing exactly half the torque, I technically could use this for measuring the CVT, but after connecting a pair of them to the input and output, we'd be losing half the torque to the input, and then half of that remaining torque to the output, meaning we'd only have a quarter left to actually power anything with. Just for testing this, I guess this could have worked, but I really wanted something that I could use to measure the torque of a mechanism continuously while it's in use, in which case it really needs to measure the torque without influencing it. That way, I can also use this to measure all kinds of other mechanisms in the future. So with that off the table, I started looking at how real-world torque measurers typically work. The basic principle is to have a long, thin axle connected from the input to the output, which twists more the more torque gets applied across its ends. Measuring how much it's twisted tells you how much torque is being applied. So, using that principle, this is what I came up with. I'll explain in a moment why this doesn't waste any torque like the previous idea did, but first, let me show how it actually works. So, this is the input and this is the output, connected by this thin axle, like I mentioned before. And we'd essentially just insert this between our motor and whatever thing we're powering. At the moment, it's not powering anything, so there's essentially no torque being transferred along the axle so this position of the dial indicates zero torque. But if I start resisting the output, the thin axle starts to twist, since more torque is being applied to it, and the extra mechanism that I've added on here measures this twist, and moves the dial accordingly, showing this higher torque. So how exactly is it measuring this twist? Most real-world versions of this would use optical sensors here to measure the angle of twist, but obviously that wasn't an option here. So to measure it mechanically, I've connected each end of the axle directly into this differential piece. Connected like this, the differential essentially shows us the difference between how far each end of the axle has rotated, and this is connected to the dial. So if the axle doesn't twist, both ends turn the same amount, and the differential housing doesn't move. But if the axle twists, the ends move different amounts, causing the differential housing, and therefore the dial, to move. My biggest problem with this design is that we have to apply a lot of torque to make the axle twist, way more than will be present in the CVT, and even that way it barely twists. I've already geared up both ends of the axle to make the dowel turn further for a given amount of twist, but even this way it doesn't turn far. Combined with the huge amount of backlash in the gears, and it's pretty much impossible to get a meaningful measurement from this. So instead of twisting a fixed axle, I realised that I could get the same effect by connecting two axles with some rubber bands like this. Except now this can twist much further, and needs a lot less torque to do so. This idea was a massive step in the right direction, but this specific design was a bit too weak, and proved to be a bit unreliable. So finally, I came up with this design, 
Again, you'd place this between your input and output here, and this dial shows the torque. Here though, I'm using this fancier mechanism to control how much the axle twists. It still makes use of rubber bands, but in this configuration they're much more reliable. It needs a good amount of force to twist it, but not too much, and using three segments like this means it can twist nice and far, which means the dowel is a lot more responsive to changes in torque. And if I connect a single pair of clutch gears to the input and output, when I try and turn the one on the input, both the input and output clutches slip equally, showing that the output is experiencing the exact same torque as the input, which is exactly what we want to see. So, how come this design manages to measure the torque without wasting any of it, so 100% of the input torque still gets transferred to the output? It still uses stretching rubber bands, so how come these don't waste any torque here? The way to think of this is that the rubber bands are being used in the transmission of the torque from the input to the output. So, when I try to rotate the input, all that force is being transferred into this arm, trying to pull this rubber band this way. And then, crucially, this rubber band, stretched or not, exerts that same force again on this arm to try to pull it along with it. And then this arm exerts that same force again trying to pull this rubber band. And again this rubber band, regardless if it's being stretched, exerts the exact same force again trying to pull on this arm. And this arm is connected directly to the output, and so transfers all of its torque to it. So you see, at every step along the way, Equal and opposite forces mean that every bit of force we applied to the input gets transferred all the way through to the output. What's more, this is the same principle that my automatic CVT mechanism is using to detect when the output torque is higher, and thereby automatically increase the gear ratio, without wasting any torque in the process, despite it also relying on stretching rubber bands. This is because, just like in the torque measurer, all the torque that the input axle applies to this wheel gets transferred into these rubber bands. But then, the rubber bands transfer all of that force on into these arms of the wheel, which they can then use to put on the chain to turn the output wheel, so none is wasted. In contrast, in the first design I showed, forcing the rubber band to stretch just pulls on this fixed beam, so that force is essentially just wasted. A good analogy that I think makes this clearer is, imagine you've got a car and you're using it to tow something, and you want to measure how much force you're having to apply in order to pull it along. The equivalent of this torque measurer would be to replace the string pulling the weight with a rubber band. This way, the amount of force that's needed to pull the weight can be seen by how much the band gets stretched. And yet, regardless how much it stretches, all of that force is still being transferred through it to pull the block, so you're not wasting anything. In contrast, my first design would be like, you're pulling the weight, still with a string, but now you bring on a second weight that you don't want to be pulling, with the same weight as the first one, and connect that one with a rubber band to your car. I mean, sure, the band stretches, and it tells you how much force you're applying, but to do it, you're having to lug around twice the weight that you should be. So, finally, in order to use this to test the CVT, I just need to know what torque values correspond to the different dialed positions. That's pretty simple. I just fix one end of the mechanism, and see how much torque I need to apply to the other end in order to turn it. I first thought about creating different torques by hanging weights from a drum, like I've done in previous videos, but the amount of torque that's needed to turn this meant that the calibrated weights I normally use would be way too light, and hanging a kilo of weight off the side of this machine didn't seem like the best idea anyway. So instead, I went for a bit of an out of the box idea. I put a weighing scale under the mechanism, and attached this small assembly to the axle. I then made this arm with a 90 degree bend. I rested it freely on the scale, and zeroed it to subtract the weight of the arm. I then twisted the axle by 60 degrees, and inserted the arm into that small assembly, and looked at the reading on the scale. So what on earth does all of this mean? Since I've twisted the axle to 60 degrees this way, which stretched the rubber bands within the mechanism, it's applying an equal and opposite torque, trying to turn this arm clockwise. And this torque corresponds to this position that the dial has moved to. So, if we know the value of this torque, we'll know what number to write on the scale. So this torque, whatever it may be, is creating a clockwise moment on this arm, which, since these beams are at right angles, means it's creating a force vertically downwards, at this distance from the pivot. And the force that this arm exerts is exactly the weight that we see on the scale, 
42 grams in this case. But of course, this is showing us the mass, not a force. So we need to multiply it by the acceleration of gravity to get the force. And then multiply this by the horizontal distance from the pivot to find the moment of the arm. Which is exactly equal to the torque being applied to the mechanism, which we now know is 3.6 newton centimeters in this case. So we can add that point onto the dial readings. And then I can take off the arm, turn the axle another 60 degrees, and then connect the arm back on. And now the scale shows us the force corresponding to this position on the dial. And finally, after turning it another 60 degrees, it shows the force being applied here. And with those numbers, I can run through the same calculations as before to fill in the torque values for the rest of the dial. You can see that it's non-linear, which is due to the nature of the rubber bands, but as long as the numbers themselves are correct, we're good to go. And with that done, we can finally use this to test the CVT. So back on the CVT, I'm going to gear down the output a bit first. The reason for this is that when the CVT is in its highest gear like this, the gear ratio is less than one. So the output turns faster than the input, but with less torque. There's nothing wrong with this, but once I start measuring the torque, it will be a lot clearer if the input and output both start off with the same torque, and then the output can just increase from there. As luck would have it, these two gears create almost the exact same gear ratio as the CVT does when it's in its highest gear like this. So with this, the input and output are running at roughly the same speed, and therefore have the same torque. And using the torque measurer, we'll be able to see if slowing the output actually increases its torque beyond this. So now, instead of driving the input axle directly with this motor, I'll connect it through the torque measurer mechanism. This will allow us to seamlessly measure the torque that the motor is applying to the input without using any of it up. And then I can connect a second one to the output, which will show how much resistance I'm applying to it. And this will allow us to compare the two values. So to start with, with nothing connected to the output, the input and output of the CVT are both experiencing very little torque, as well as showing roughly the same torque value, as we'd expect, since the gear ratio is 1 to 1. But when I start resisting the output, both torques go up slightly, but then, boom, the output torque keeps going up as I apply more resistance, but the input torque doesn't go up any further. This is exactly what we want to see. When I apply the first little bit of resistance, it's not enough to make the CVT change its gear ratio, so both the input and output torques increase. But with any more resistive torque than that, the CVT automatically increases its gear ratio, which gives the input more mechanical advantage, and so keeps the input torque low, even as the output torque continues to increase, meaning the motor doesn't have to work any harder. This is so so cool to see, and shows that our automatic CVT is working exactly as intended. Now, as a point of comparison, let me replace the CVT's input wheel, which so far has been able to shrink to increase the gear ratio, with this one that's fixed at its largest position. This means that the CVT is now fixed in its highest gear, where the overall gear ratio from the input to the output is 1 to 1. And now, when I start resisting the output, both dials go up equally, showing that the input is having to provide the exact same torque that we're using to slow the output. And because of this, you can hear that the motor is having to work a lot harder than it did before. And finally, let me connect on the not so great torque measurer that I showed off at the start of the video to see how much torque it's wasting between the input and output. When I start resisting the output, even with just enough force to make the output torque go up slightly, the input torque already massively shoots up. And if I apply any more torque, it actually makes the motor stall. Looking at this from the back, you can see that the rubber band is stretching as I apply more resistance to the output, so that mechanism technically is measuring the torque, but it's at the cost of a huge amount of the input torque. So, now that we know this CVT works really well, I know I said I'd put it in a car, and I really wanted to do that in this video. But just getting to this point already took me a lot longer than I expected. So, I hope you don't mind if I save testing out the automatic car for the next video.
And as well as that, I'll be trying coupling two of these CVTs together, and maybe I'll try putting that in a car as well. With all that said though, I'm really happy with how this torque measuring system turned out, and I'm sure it'll make plenty of appearances in my future videos. So for now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.